In 1968, Maeve Leakey, her husband Richard Leakey, and a team of scientists decided to explore around Lake Turkana in northern Kenya and Ethiopia in hopes to discover more about early hominins. The Turkana Basin was already recognized as a hotspot for prehistoric fossils, but Richard Leakey was intrigued by a particular region, Kubifora, due to its unique rock formations. This area was overlooked by other archaeologists as it was believed to be made out of igneous rock. Igneous rock is solid, cooled down lava, so it would not preserve any useful fossils for prehistory. Leakey felt differently. He believed that the rocks were sedimentary, formed by an accumulation of particles over time, so fossils and hominin evidence would be well preserved if present in these rocks. Leakey's instinct was right. What the Kubifora Research Project discovered at this site during excavations in 1972 would fill a significant gap in the archaeological record of early humans, the earliest evidence of fire usage dating around 1.6 to 1.5 million years ago. Two excavations at Kubifora, FXJJ20 East and FXJJ20 Main, contained very small concentrations of rubified sediment aggregates. Scientists performed magnetometry, thermoluminescence, and phytoliths analyses on these sediments, which verified that these two sites were indeed correlated with fires. There were also other materials recovered nearby, including stone tools and bone concentrations, that were found to be related to the rubified sediment concentrations. The presence of these materials in these sediments suggests that these materials had strong associations with fire, so what does this point to? Likely evidence that hominin activities were associated with these fire remains. These discoveries were a good start, but the technological analyses in the 70s and 80s were not nearly up to today's standards. This left many researchers skeptical whether these two sites really pointed toward hard evidence of hominins using fire. Between 2010 and 2015, scientists excavated the last unexcavated layer at FXJJ20AB, which was their last chance to analyze any fire evidence at the site. Using more modern technology, scientists hoped to prove that the site was truly from anthropogenic origin. Researchers were able to make several significant conclusions employing new methods, including soil micromorphology, FTIR, and spatial analysis. They concluded that the hominin evidence of artifacts with the presence of fire had very strong similarities to the distribution pattern seen in many prehistoric hearths with more advanced fire usage. This finding confirms that the presence of fire in Kubifora really was due to human activity in this area, as it follows the same patterns as indisputable fire hearths that existed later on. This site also provides the most conclusive evidence of the use of fire in earlier eras. Other sites in Africa, including Swartkrins in South Africa and Chesawanja in Kenya, do not provide the ideal setting to determine whether or not fire at these sites were indeed of anthropogenic origins. In other words, these sites have not been preserved in a manner that could allow researchers to use similar analytical methods to Kubifora, and researchers therefore could not prove if these fires were accidental or associated with human activity. Researchers assume that since the presence of fire began around the same time in these areas, hominins were able to control these fires. But of course, although we have strong evidence of hominin associations with fire hinting at the control of fire, we will never be 100% sure of what happened at these sites and others. The use of fire is a clear achievement for early humans and it would have had a huge impact on their life. Early humans were capable of consuming a fully raw diet but studies have shown that modern-day women who follow an all-raw diet experience chronic energy shortage. This chronic lack of energy negatively impacts bodily functions, particularly their reproductive system. The presence of fire would have enabled hominins to cook their food, which would have increased the food's digestibility. Increased digestibility means that less energy would be spent digesting and more energy could be spent elsewhere, such as on brain development. Fires would have also provided hominins with a source of heat on cooler days, which would have reduced the risk of hypothermia and potential death. Most of these African sites developed a million years ago and grew more prevalent as time passed. Moving on to Europe, what was going on with fire there at that time? Would you expect a similar timeline in Europe as Africa? The answer is no. 
The existence of fire in hominin life appears to have begun much later in Europe. The earliest evidence of fire in Europe has been discovered at Beach's Pit in England and Skoningen in Germany excavation sites, which existed around 400,000 years ago. At Skoningen, heated flints and charred wood were found, including a wooden tool, which demonstrates that there was a presence of at least one hominin at the site. At Beach's Pit, heated lithic assemblages and sediments were found that also hinted at fire evidence. These early sites provide some evidence of fire and hominin activity, but there is still a huge gap in the fire record. Although some argue that poor preservation could cause the lack of fire evidence, European sites such as Grandolina in Spain and La Cône d'Arago in France provide reliable evidence of hominin activity. Many bones and stone tools were found, but there just wasn't any evidence of fire. This demonstrates that hominins occupied these sites for several hundred thousand years and thus were able to survive in the European environment. Early humans are believed to have occupied Europe around 900,000 years ago. These hominins were able to survive in Europe even without fire. The different environments that hominins encountered in Africa and Europe may explain the discrepancies in fire use. The tropics and subtropics of Africa provided drier zones for a fire to survive. With the addition of lightning strikes and accidental fires, hominins in Africa would have come in contact with natural wildfires more often than hominins in the cooler, more humid environment of Europe. These observations led researchers to believe that hominins in Africa at that time were probably manipulating wildfires to their advantage instead of actually being able to start their own. Researchers have wondered how these hominins survived the colder, harsher weather of the north. It is important to understand that these early humans were migrating from Africa to Europe, and they would have definitely have been vulnerable to the cold and relied on thermoregulatory adaptations to survive. Researchers have postulated four possible adaptations that could have generally prevented hypothermia. Hominins could have had winter fur and subcutaneous fat, which is believed to have been able to prevent hypothermia. The fur would have added thermal resistance, similar to clothing, in order to prevent heat loss. Subcutaneous fat would have provided insulation for the body. Comparisons to hominins' close relatives show that they would have already had this layer of fat when they became bipedal thousands of years before entering Europe. Researchers also believe a thick layer of muscle could have provided up to 5% reduction in heat loss when hominins were active. The accompaniment of fur and fat with muscle would have definitely prevented hypothermia during activity. The last adaptation, the development of clothing to protect against the cold, seems to be the most plausible. The creation of clothing for warmth and survival would have been a behavioral change that could be more quickly achieved than the thousands of years it would have taken for evolutionary changes to take place. We can all agree that wearing clothes provides warmth. But did you know that a simple cloak of animal fur is believed to reduce heat loss by 44%? Such a significant change would have enabled early humans to survive in Europe without the use of fire. Although, I would definitely still argue that they might not have been totally happy with the climate, as preventing hypothermia and feeling cold are two completely different ballgames.